Thanks, Parker. Parker doesn't know this, but he has a cameo in my presentation, so. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Mary Kate, I'm a biologist at the Fish and Wildlife um, Fisheries Program here in Anchorage, work with Dan Ranella and John Gerken, who've been presenters and session chairs at this meeting a lot over the years, um, and also wanted to point out my other partner, Colette, who's here today, um, who made a, a lot of the work that we're doing on Jay Bear possible. So just to start, um, I kind of wanted to talk about why we first got interested in working on base. Um, and me, Dan, and John have had a large interest in freshwater productivity, which is um, things that are happening during the early life history of salmon um, in the freshwater environment that are affecting smolt production. Um, and we kind of teamed up with Jay Bear because they're also interested in salmon production on base. Um, both from a conservation standpoint and from the standpoint of uh, food production for endangered Cook Inlet beluga whales um, that are feeding adjacent to base boundaries. And um, if you were here yesterday, Sarah O'Neill did a good uh, overview of the literature and how important salmon can be to belugas as a primary prey resource. So I'm gonna orient you a little bit to um, where all of our studies have been occurring. So um, Jay Bear is down here, and, and you can see the base boundary here in the gray. It's about 78,000 acres, I think we looked up yesterday, so it's a really, really large size. Um, not technically in the Matsu, but with a lot of systems that drain out into the Kinnick Arm, so we're very close by. Um, and the system that I'm mainly going to be talking about today um, is, is zoomed in here, and it's Six Mile Lake. This is uh, the system on base that has the largest abundance of salmon returns. Um, so we have several thousand sockeye returning every year to this system, um, as well as a couple hundred coho. Um, and as you can see here, um, the lake uh, directly feeds out into the Kinnick Arm. There's about a mile of creek habitat in there um, that all the salmon are migrating through. As far as what species are present there, like I said, um, sockeye, and these sockeye salmon genetic studies actually show that they are originated from the big lake, or similar to big lake stocks. So although we're not in the Matsu, we have some Matsu-related salmon um, over there in Jay Bear, and they probably naturally colonized this area because this lake was originally a long creek, um, but it was impounded to form a float plain base. Um, and now is rather large float plane base still operational right now. Um, in addition to salmon, we also have stocked rainbow trout, fishing game, uh, stocks about 1,000 trout into the upper part of this lake um, for recreational opportunities for um, people on base to fish. Um, we have naturally occurring Dolly Varden that we've caught during some of our studies, um, and this is an extremely productive Stickleback Lake, tons of stickleback everywhere. If you're a stickleback biologist or you're interested in stickleback, this would be a really good place to come and study them because there's a ton. Um, and then kind of a lot of the focus of the, uh, my talk now will be on pike. Um, they were first found in the system in September of 2020, and I put a little star here for uh, kind of where the first fishermen caught a pike in the system. After that, um, Fish and Game was really great about immediately getting involved, and we got out there to do some exploratory gill netting. Um, and then over the next two years, these are the main areas of the lake where we've recovered invasive pike. Um, so this is like a boat launch area. Um, these are all, as Parker would say, like very pikey habitat. So um, just a lot of vegetation, not a lot of moving water, um, and the orange stars here are gill netting that occurred in the summer. So we um, did both winter and summer gill netting. I'm going to talk to that, talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, and then these white stars are areas where we had gill nets in the winter and also recovered pike. Okay, so that gets me into a little bit of my research questions for the talk. Um, <clears throat> so 
We are interested in s juvenile salmon productivity from a lot of different angles here, and this predation project is just one of many projects that we currently have going on. And the impetus for this was really um, early when I started in 2019. There had been a lot of observations of rainbow trout hanging out during um, the outmigration season, right during the uh, near the lake outlet, and they were kind of picking off a lot of salmon as they were out migrating. So although literature you know, shows that salmon can be present in rainbow trout diets, but they're not usually a primary prey source, we kind of wanted to look into that just to make sure that um, our stocking ability or our stocking program was not interfering with uh, salmon production on base. That was the original impetus. Um, and then when we had the pike invasion happen at the same time, bad for salmon, but good for our predation studies so we could study the interaction of all those different things that are happening. Um, and the three main things that we are looking at with these predation studies are one, um, which is just species. So as I said, we had stocked rainbow trout um, and we had pike. And also during the study, we discovered there were residual coho salmon, so coho that were not migrating out to the ocean, but instead staying in the lake. Um, and they were consuming some salmon as well. We also wanted to look at predator size um, to see if that was significant in salmonid predation um, and season of the year. This, I think, was a really good opportunity to look at winter consumption of salmon. A lot of most studies have just focused on um, collecting fish during the summer and looking at their consumption of salmon. So this was an opportunity to kind of look at um, another season during the year. So now I will talk, or I'll show you a little bit about our methods. Obviously, we all did gill netting. I think most people here are familiar with what that entails. Um, and, but here's kind of how we set up some of the winter gill nets. Um, let me see if these videos are going to work. Well, they worked when we practiced before. <laughs> um, let's see here. Oh, well. It, no, it's fine. I mean, if you've ever given a presentation, it's like the likelihood of the video working is <laughs> extremely low. Um, but anyways, um, I'll just go over the basic process. I just thought it was kind of cool because we um, drilled some holes in the ice, and then uh, Fishing Game has a pretty cool drone that's able to take out a line or take it back in. So we, um, Parker, operated. He's the only one with the drone skills. He um, operated the drone so we could set up a gill net under the ice in the winter and then pull it through and put it back in every time um, that we wanted to reset it after checking it. So that was kind of cool. Um, and then in the summer, like I said, just regular gill net sets, uh, usually leaving them to soak overnight. But in the summer, there's more consideration for bycatch, especially waterfowl um, on base. So winter was actually pretty good. We had a high catch rate for pike and not as many um, bycatch considerations. So yeah, if you're a fan of fish guts, then you might like the slide. If not, it might gross you out. <laughs> um, but all of the fish that we collected during this effort, um, we had, like I said, we had bycatch of both trout and co salmon. Um, and, and then we had pike that we were targeting. So we brought those back to the lab. We did basic stomach analyses um, that included identifying all the prey contents and weighing them individually. Weights are really important. Um, if we want to compare our diet studies to others in Alaska or in the lower 48, um, it just forms like this kind of baseline. Um, and then also for use in bioenergetic models. So that's why we weight everything individually. You can see here, this is a rather large salmon smolt inside a pike stomach. Um, and yeah, lots of stickleback and lots of inverts, especially dragonfly larvae. Okay. So again, just wanted to go back to those, re oh, I only have three minutes left? Okay. Wanted to go back to those research questions because that's, um, these three main things are going to be how I present uh, the results here. So these are just the top prey items um, of importance by mass. So we have our three species here, coho, pike, and rainbow trout, and then their top three diet items. Um, we did obviously expect that salmon would be present in pike diets based on other studies, um, but what we didn't expect was this percentage. So 
almost every pike that we sampled that had something in its stomach had salmon. And uh, by weight, it was pr basically the only prey item um, that they were consuming. And like I said, it's a big stickleback lake. Definitely a lot of studies showing pike feeding on stickleback. So we were expecting a little bit more in there. But they were really keyed in on salmon. Um, and I won't get in too much to the rainbow and the coho diets, but they're primarily feeding on stickleback and dragonfly larvae with an occasional other prey item, other inverts, or um, sometimes salmon. So this first plot here, I'm just showing you, um, we're, we're only looking at salmon consumption. So this is just salmon prey by mass. And then this is size of the predator. And we have the three predators here. We have a limited size distribution of pike because it was a recent invasion, so we really had one, eight, two age classes. This is like the founding age class that's these larger individuals, and then this was the age class behind it. Um, and then you can see the distribution of sizes for coho and rainbows here. Coho are still pretty small. They're either smolt or they're um, young resident coho, so we didn't get an especially large fish size there. But main takeaways from this um, are just that pike are, were consuming salmon no matter um, what size they were, and that um, the few instances of coho and rainbow consuming salmon, they were actually tended to be um, smaller size fish. This uh, next plot is just about seasons. So we have ice off season, which is going to be approximately like May to October, and then ice on is going to be like November to April. Um, and I guess the main takeaway here is that pike are consuming salmon in both seasons um, with of a substantial mass. So I think a lot of studies are focused on the summer, but this might indicate that um, really more research needs to be looked into the win potential winter effects of invasive pike on um, salmon, especially in overwintering habitats where they're very sensitive um, in their life history. So I'll just summarize quickly here. Um, Northern pike consumed more salmon than the other predator species. They consumed them in both seasons of the year. Um, and predator size was not really a significant predictor of salmonid consumption, um, at least the data that we have. In the future, um, all of these factors I've put into a, a, GL, a general, generalized linear model, and we're going through iterations of, right that, of that right now, but I wasn't quite ready to present it today, um, some kinks that we want to work out. Uh, we did send out a lot of these samples for stable isotopes, and I think that'll be really helpful because diet studies are just a small snapshot in time, and you don't really know over a longer period of time if that's... Um, representative of what the fish are eating, so stable isotopes will tell us that. Um, we hope to put this into a bioenergetics model, because from a fisheries biologist standpoint, we want to know what are the effects on salmon, how many salmon um, can each pike consume in a year, um, and that's the information that, that we're really interested in and we're hoping to be able to get out of this in the future. Um, we are still looking for pike on Six Mile, but we have not caught one since early this year, um, despite some gill netting efforts, so we're cautiously optimistic. Um, and this could be an example of an early targeted uh, gill netting effort that is actually able to um, eradicate a population without the need for rotenone or anything like that. So that could be really exciting. Um, I wish I had more time, but yeah, there's also potentially looking into, um, we know that they were brought by a float plane just based on otolith microchemistry data, and um, we're kind of working with base on, with flight records to identify the timing of that. And um, it would be, I think, really great to make an example and actually um, have someone responsible for the invasion, um, as this is like such a big problem in the Matsu. OK, well, that's it. And I'll thank everyone that's helped um, my two texts from the summer are here today. So just want to give them a shout out. and. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone else here. One question, if anyone has it. Oh. So uh, 
you said um, it appeared that it came in through a float plane. So you've done some stable isotope analysis and didn't find a saltwater signature. Is that is that where that's coming from? Um, it's coming from otolith microchemistry. Um, and Parker and Chrissy can maybe talk a little bit more about that because they send a lot of otoliths up to the lab at UAF. Um, and this one, I don't have a, I haven't seen like the actual graphical data representation of the data, but um, the professor that we work with, um, yeah, indicated that it was no salt water signature and there was a um, distinct introduction event from another lake. <laughs> 